Hello and welcome to Working Historians, a podcast where we discover what historians do with their lives. I am Rob Denning, the Associate Dean for History at Southern New Hampshire University's Global Campus. Today I am talking to Dr. Stephanie Averill. Those of you who have been paying attention should remember Stephanie from another episode way back in April of 2017 when we discussed her academic and professional career. Today, she's going to share her research in a presentation called Our Boys, The First Status of Forces Treaties and the Problem of Jurisdiction. So, Stephanie, can you tell us a bit about yourself first? Sure. Hi, Rob. Thanks for the introduction. I have been teaching with Southern New Hampshire University for a couple of years and with other universities before that. I uh, teach in the master's program, which I love, uh, all over the place. I teach everything from historiography to the capstone and uh, a, quite a few in between, which has been a blast for me because I'm kind of a jack-of-all-trades historian. I love to do uh, different things. In fact, that's kind of what led me to this project is I was working on something else, and squirrel, off I go in another <laughs> direction. <laughs> Great. Well, I think what we'll do is we will talk more about that, but for now, why don't you uh, tell us about the Status of Forces Treaty, and then we will come back and talk about some of the behind-the-scenes stuff. Okay, sounds good. So our story begins one night in the summer of 1953. Two U.S. Army privates with a history of getting into trouble went AWOL, and after a night of drunken gambling decided they wanted to head into the city for some laughs, so they hailed a cab. Short on cash, they just took the vehicle, beating up the 65-year-old cab driver, nearly strangling him to death, and leaving him in a roadside ditch. They were caught pled guilty to the charges, and were sentenced to five years in prison, considerably shorter than the usual sentence for such a crime. Now, when the story hit the news, the American public was outraged that they were given any prison time at all. You see, they'd committed the act while stationed in France, and as they were off-duty and off-post, they were charged in a French court. Despite prior criminal records, including imprisonment, or their violent nighttime assault that left the taxi driver unable to work for a month, they were painted as impetuous youth on a joyride. Though by all accounts they had an excellent attorney, qualified interpreters, and an American military legal representative counsel, U.S. public opinion persisted in viewing them as victims of a kangaroo court deprived of their rights. The previous April, the United States Senate approved a treaty commonly known as the Status of Forces Agreement, or SOFA. This treaty between the members of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization was unprecedented, much as the agreement creating that organization had been four years earlier. It governed the privileges and protections granted by each of the sovereign powers to each other's troops within their borders. Founded on the principles of equality and reciprocity, at least on paper, the NATO alliance came up with a practical arrangement to deal with the new circumstances involved in the semi-permanent presence of foreign military forces on these nations' soil, particularly as regarded the question of criminal jurisdiction over members of those forces. On its face, a triumph for the principles and claims of the free world partnership, the NATO SOFA was, in fact, born out of resentments, frictions, and an acrimonious debate that, though ostensibly about the legal issues, revealed profound ideological unease about the growing United States' role in the world. In the United States, soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines were our boys, a profoundly personal and emotive symbol of the nation itself. To the NATO allies and their civilian populations, they could also serve as a symbol, but one of encroachment both a reminder of dependency and a slippery slope of imperialism and extraterritoriality. Previously, the military of one state entered another only in transit, as defender, or as conqueror, and therefore was generally given leeway in terms of jurisdiction over the members of its force. But with the onset of the Cold War, and particularly after the creation of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, large bodies of troops were semi-permanently stationed in foreign countries. In light of the radically different circumstances, legal precedent was virtually useless to determine exactly how the contending sovereignties ought to be resolved. <clears throat> the internal debate in the United States boiled down to a fundamental clash of cultures that cast light on the American adjustment to its expanded global responsibilities in the modern age. 
On the one hand, many insisted that the U.S. must ensure the best possible conditions for our boys serving abroad, which in their minds included immunity from the local law of foreign nations where they were stationed. This was interpreted by SOF opponents as a core principle of international law. Many Americans failed to see why U.S. servicemen ought to be deprived of the protection of the Constitution simply because they wore a uniform. On the other hand, such a unilateralist approach came into fundamental conflict with the multilateral concept at the heart of NATO. International law could not strip a sovereign nation of elements of its sovereignty without its consent. The citizens of other NATO partners resented the imperialistic relationship that would be implied by a permanent grant of extraterritoriality. An equal association of sovereign nations for mutual defense could not tolerate the de jure creation of first- and second-class partners, even if such distinctions were a de facto reality. It was only the multilateral and reciprocal nature of SOFA that made any concessions on jurisdiction remotely acceptable to public opinion on either side of the Atlantic. It was to become one of the most contentious issues amongst the closest of allies, one that engaged attention and passions around the world. The United States Department of State often found itself in the middle of careful and often hostile scrutiny. Allies, enemies, and non-aligned nations of the world were on alert for signs of imperialistic attitudes, racial or cultural bias, and other evidence that the United States was only superficially committed to genuine alliance and multilateral defense. On the other hand, many in government, the military, and the public at large searched for signs that the diplomats, already under suspicion in the early 1950s, were not adequately protecting American interests, so-called rights, and privileges. Balancing the two would become practically a full-time occupation for many officials. This delicate operation was essential in order to persuade the Allies to extend the necessary base rights and, at the same time, convince U.S. Congress and public opinion to fund military aid programs. Now, historians have done a lot of excellent work on the relationship between large bodies of American troops and local European populations, both during World War II and afterward. These relations could be both friendly and contentious, and certainly served as important symbols on both sides. During the pre-NATO period, most U.S. allies took a somewhat lenient stance towards the exercise of their sovereign rights to jurisdiction over these foreign forces in their midst. After all, the UCMJ was actually far stricter in its punishments for theft, assault, rape, and murder than most local courts would be. Nevertheless, in many cases, these governments took a lot of heat from their own populations, who were angered by the apparently privileged status of Americans in uniform, what they seemed to have, and, and wary of what such extraterritoriality implied. During wartime, or for the temporary presence of limited forces after the war was over, relatively informal arrangements would suffice. However, the creation of NATO implied a much larger, more permanent presence, those nations, such as France, Britain, Italy, and so on, who anticipated large contingents of foreign troops on their soil, insisted on a more permanent solution, preferably on a multilateral basis, which would codify their sovereign rights to jurisdiction and carefully define those circumstances under which jurisdiction would be retained by the sending state. Several of the United States allies insisted that before additional troop dispositions could take place or base rights established, the NATO nations would have to address these issues. Initially, United States partners would generally phrase their concerns in terms of requests for revision. But as sovereign nations answerable to their own populations, when push came to shove, they would ultimately be forced to assert their sovereignty, which could seriously erode the strategic and ideological strength of NATO. The problem remained. If the United States was unable to come to an agreement with its allies on the contentious issue of jurisdiction and the status of their forces, it would undermine the strategic position of the entire free world alliance system. Though most of the United States allies were more than willing to voluntarily waive their jurisdiction in the vast majority of cases, the principle of sovereignty that they had a right to jurisdiction in the first place was vitally important to them especially in this early period, tracing the dimensions of Cold War relationships.
The members of the Brussels Pact had signed an agreement on December 21, 1949, in which they agreed to the principle of concurrent jurisdictional arrangements. For the United States to be singled out for greater privileges would be ideologically embarrassing, to say the least. The State Department concluded early in 1950 that, at least within NATO, the best solution to the problem of determining jurisdictional authority and other matters was a multilateral agreement on the Brussels Pact model. Reading the diplomatic tea leaves and anticipating Allied pressure would only grow, State put together a working group to come up with an approved draft negotiating position for a multilateral agreement. It would be important to get the U.S. executive departments on the same page before they had to sit at the negotiating table with their allies, but this proved nearly impossible. Within the executive branch itself, the Department of Defense and the military services proved amongst the most stubborn and persistent opponents of any formula that would see U.S. military personnel in foreign courts. They remained convinced throughout the entire process that international law dictated that military personnel always remained under the jurisdiction of military authorities. Though defense and military officials couched their objections in to concurrent jurisdictional arrangements in terms of military readiness and force function, when pressed, they stated their position more clearly, that they felt duty-bound to do as much as possible for our boys. Their first draft of a proposed negotiating position only superficially resembled what the NATO allies had been demanding, and several defense representatives vented their disdain for states' more internationalist position by reminding their counterparts in the State Department, don't forget that you will be negotiating this treaty for the United States. Even when officially committed to supporting the official line of mutual recognition for sovereignty and the concurrent jurisdictional model, after being brought to heel by higher executive accord authorities, of course. DOD and military branch negotiators took every opportunity to fight a rearguard action against the acknowledgement of foreign jurisdiction over American military personnel. For instance, defense insisted on a provision to exempt line-of-duty offenses from local jurisdiction, while deferring the definition of line-of-duty until after the agreement was signed. Of course, this kind of a blank check calls the United States' good faith into question. Negotiating committees that were supposed to be working out the details of accepted points of agreement found themselves retracing old ground. Implementation became an excuse to wring non-reciprocal privileges out of increasingly annoyed allies. Most of the NATO nations were willing to agree to so-called better-than-SOF arrangements, though usually on a classified basis. They didn't want their populations finding out about those. But these private understandings, they would guarantee the way of jurisdiction in all but the most important cases. Ironically, defenses intransigence made U.S. allies less, not more likely, to make these concessions. At long last, and despite last-minute quibbling by the Defense Department, the NATO partners signed the Status of Forces Agreement and moved toward its ratification. But the Senate approval would be complicated by the Defense Department's ongoing lack of enthusiasm for SOFA and lack of understanding of international law. When preparing to present the completed and signed SOF treaty to Congress, many key military figures said that they would support the treaty, but, unless ordered not to, would give their true opinion of the treaty, if asked. An ominous statement, to say the least. As desperately as the Allies wished SOFA to be ratified, to rush the measure through, the ratification process could potentially endanger its success. No one was looking forward to the presentation of the SOF treaty to Congress. Not the State Department, not Defense, and certainly not the Senators who traditionally supported the administration's foreign policy. Even they had to be persuaded that a model maintaining exclusive jurisdiction over U.S. forces was unacceptable to the NATO allies during peacetime. That this really was the furthest these sovereign partners were willing to go, and that Americans in uniform abroad would be more thoroughly protected under this treaty than they would be without it. The State Department delayed for months before submitting it to the Senate, hoping to gather more support and resolve the differences in the executive departments. But the Allies were increasingly irritated, and non-ratification began to hold up other vital defense arrangements. And so, in spite of the uncertainties that remained, nearly a year after it was signed, the Secretary of State finally formally submitted the treaty to the President, who forwarded it to the Senate for its advice and consent. Even then, it wasn't until well into 1953 that the actual ratification process began.
In the meantime, the State Department compiled a volume of documentation on the advantages of the NATO Status of Forces Treaty, especially considering the incoming Secretaries of State and Defense would have little or no background knowledge on this crucial agreement. The briefing documents included extensive materials on the Allies, the law, previously existing arrangements, and the possible answer to any question. It was going to be difficult to drive home the point that previously existing arrangements were temporary and fluctuating, not entirely applicable for current world conditions. This meant that as things stood, many privileges and protections would not be enforceable in the courts of other nations, unlike under the NATO Status of Forces Agreement. The most challenging obstacle for the treaty supporters was the wall of ignorance regarding international law, jurisdiction, and the interaction of contending sovereignties. An extensive defense of the NATO SOFA would require an in-depth examination of the statuses of innumerable court cases all over the world. This is exactly what the Legal Advisor's Office set out to do, and in the process laid out the core meaning of the new global arrangements. U.S. engagement in a multilateral agreement with sovereign equals. Its report cited cases from the Court of International Justice and the U.S. Supreme Court to demonstrate the inviolability of national sovereignty, including a quote by Chief Justice John Marshall asserting that a nation is susceptible of no limitation not imposed by itself. That applies not just to the United States, after all. Thus, both law and practice indicated the principle of international law that visiting forces did not possess extraterritorial immunity, which is what made the SOF treaty necessary in the first place. And yet, it was exactly the point that opponents would contend. Though the Senate Foreign Relations Committee gave its unanimous approval to the treaty, the debate was bitter and fraught with misinformation designed to inflame and alarm public opinion. <clears throat> As anticipated, Senator Bricker of Ohio proved to be one of the most vocal opponents of the NATO SOFA. He introduced a reservation to the treaty, providing for the exclusive jurisdiction for American military forces and offered a similar arrangement for foreign forces in the United States if they requested it. His argument relied on dubious legal and factual foundations. He asserted that international law provided for the members of a force to remain always under the jurisdiction of their own government. Any executive agreements that had ceded away this right in the past were illegally made, in his opinion, in violation of the Uniform Code of Military Justice, and therefore would have no legal weight as precedent. He railed that the texts of these illegal agreements were being kept from the Congress, even though summary texts had been provided, and argued that what was visible of the SOF Treaty did not include some key rights guaranteed by the U.S. Constitution, such as trial by jury, public trial, and so forth. He harped on the fact that it subjected the troops to double jeopardy, even though the treaty overtly prohibited it. He drove home the point that if the U.S. gave up the constitutionally protected rights of its citizens in uniform in one instance, it would have to give them up in every single nation where Americans were stationed. Finally, to drive home the potential horrors of foreign courts, he cited a case, nebulously described, in which an American tried in a Turkish court, oh, or was it in the Balkans, was supposedly sentenced to have his arm cut off and called upon the other members of Congress not to allow our boys to be subject to such cruel and inhuman treatment. He appealed further to American sentiment in favor of our boys by claiming that he had assembled, and I quote, a file of letters on this subject from American servicemen and their dependents stationed all over the world. Without exception, they oppose the criminal jurisdiction provisions of the proposed treaty. Their letters tell of strong anti-American sentiment, kangaroo and star chamber court procedure, local police brutality, and in some cases, of communist judges. The Bricker Reservation would have utterly gutted the treaty, rousing even the Defense Department to action out of fear that the NATO allies would retaliate against U.S. troops already in place. Working with other senators, the members of the executive departments provided an alternative in which the Senate would instead offer guidance and interpretive understandings that would assuage fears without compromising the core content of the treaty. Though facing opposition, Bricker, utterly undeterred, continued his campaign with a letter to the chairman of the Armed Services Committee recalling his earlier argument that the treaty in effect would require American boys to leave their own rights at home when sent abroad to protect the rights of others. Calling upon the ASE to investigate 
this secret executive agreement, supposedly, that he had suspected had been giving away the rights of American servicemen since the Truman administration, he submitted a series of loaded questions to the committee. These included how many secret executive agreements have been made for the surrender of American troops to foreign courts, what is the criminal law and procedure of the nations now claiming the right to try American servicemen, who is responsible for depriving American servicemen of the protection of the Uniform Code of Military Justice, and how can jurisdiction illegally surrendered be reclaimed with the least offense to other nations. The Senate voted overwhelmingly to approve the NATO Status of Forces Treaty on July 15, 1953. Bricker had lost for the moment, but he would not give up his fight. Instead, he took it public, where he gained some powerful allies. The State Department's careful legal arguments would assert again and again that SOFA actually gave U.S. military personnel more protections than they would have in its absence. But Bricker, and increasingly vocal elements of the public and press opinion, would continue to argue as though the U.S. Constitution had extraterritorial effect. Letters began to trickle in during the Senate debate expressing their opposition to the NATO SOFA generally in terms that indicated their total ignorance of the content of the treaty or the nature of international law. And though some news outlets, generally those on the East Coast with a more internationalist bent, supported the administration's policy and properly cited the case law, the vast majority of editorial comment railed against the supposed surrender of the rights of American boys in uniform. After ratification, the trickle of protest grew to a flood. Letters and telegrams began pouring in to congressmen, the president, and the secretaries of state and defense, and generally anyone they thought would listen. And so began a practice that would last for years, carefully responding to the concerns of various largely misinformed constituencies who demanded to know why on earth the government would have negotiated such a treaty and how it could be quickly repudiated. Over time, the State Department effectively developed a form letter explaining the importance of NATO, its unprecedented task and scale, the nature of sovereignty, and the fact that the Status of Forces Treaty actually assured protections for American military personnel that they would not otherwise have. Among the largest challenges for SOFA public relations came from an editorial in the Saturday Evening Post that was right up Senator Bricker's alley, entitled, Why Should Foreign Courts Try Our GIs? The editorial repeated the position that international law upholds the immunity of friendly foreign forces from criminal law in host states. It lamented the fact that executive agreements of the past had retreated from this position and noted that, though many NATO nations' criminal law gave far more lenient sentences than U.S. military law, in the future it could apply to other nations, such as Japan and Yugoslavia, whose penal practices are vastly different from ours, they say. In one final dig, the article pointed out that while the draftee would be subject to foreign courts, the military top brass were given the very immunity that they denied to American boys. The Post article was clearly inflammatory, touching sensitive areas for its American readers. Some protests were clearly absurd. Speaking of red Chinese plots, the United Nations super governments, and the military occupation of American soil, most letters of protest, however, were more rational and revolved around what one angry writer termed putting first things first. Why is it, he asked, that we are able to aid, support, and defend these countries, and yet we're not smart enough to look after our own troops? Effectively, he asked the question on the tip of many Americans' tongues and implied a component of the so-called free world and a question that most diplomats were too careful or too polite to ask aloud. Should the United States not gain some benefits, if only out of gratitude, for the sacrifices our boys were making on behalf of others? Another area of tension was the apparent class discrimination between ordinary GIs and more educated or illustrious individuals. One news editor demanded to know, why should a soldier who's forced into the army, forced to serve in a foreign land, be denied the protection of the Constitution while civilian employees of the State Department are not? The government had already received angry letters from private citizens demanding to know the number of American citizens tried in foreign courts under the Status of Forces Treaty, as well as the details of any prison sentences to be served abroad. The Daughters of the American Revolution, the Veterans of Foreign Wars, and other patriotic organizations passed resolutions condemning the SOF Treaty and demanding its renunciation, 
The State Department could send out its form letter and insist that with or without SOFA, sovereign nations have the right to prosecute foreigners within their territories, but the righteous outrage would continue to simmer. This irreconcilable clash of cultures revealed both a powerful patriotism and a certain nostalgia for simpler times and simpler policies. One letter to the president seemed to sum up the fears and beliefs of the United States citizenry. A Mr. M. Thomason of Decatur, Illinois, wrote to Eisenhower, expressing his great astonishment at a radio program he'd heard. Though his understanding of the detail of the agreements was faulty, his grasp of the core implications seems clear. Mr. Thomason appealed to the president as general on behalf of the common soldier he used to command. He wrote, Perhaps there are times when the political leaders of this great nation would do well to inconspicuously join the rank and file of the people and feel the heartbeat of the great nation they had. I implore you, sir, to reaffirm not only my faith, but that of millions of Americans by immediately repudiating this fantastic agreement and restoring to our soldiers the protective rights to which they are entitled under the constitution of the great nation they are serving. The belief in the U.S. Constitution and in its power, even beyond American borders, remains the cornerstone of many Americans' worldview. This conviction persisted in the face of international law, the rules of sovereignty, and the careful legal and political arguments gathered by those who dealt with the day-to-day -day negotiation between both friendly and contending sovereign nations. International law is what all nations recognize and practice and not what writers advocate, reminded one of dozens of State Department briefs. The United States had to live in a world in which it could not simply demand that its ideology and values ought to govern all nations, at least not without undermining the unity of the so-called free world and eroding the political and moral high ground it so carefully attempted to construct during the Cold War. The Status of Forces Agreement and its pattern of carefully negotiated concurrent jurisdiction would remain as a permanent fixture of American policy, despite every effort to unseat it, and a permanent fixture of the post-World War II world, spreading virtually everywhere American troops would be stationed. Though a majority of Americans eventually accepted that in order to avoid the perception and the reality of imperialism, the U.S. had to follow the same rules as everyone else, it never ceased to concern Americans, who were anxious to ensure that our boys were never deprived of the legal protections they would enjoy at home, no matter how far from home the uniform took them. Thank you, Stephanie. This was a really interesting project that you have here. It's I don't even know where to start with it. It's, um, I mean, this is really well written, and you presented it very well. This is a, <laughs> it was really interesting to listen to. Um, this whole concept of opposition to the Status of Forces Agreement seems to, in some ways, I mean, this is basically the Cold War kind of, you know, all wrapped up into one little issue. <laughs> it's that the United yes. States, under the guise of spreading democracy and spreading you know, liberty and freedom and all of that. But at the same time, you have to do it the way we want you to do it. It feels like this is kind of, and I know that goes all the way back to, you know, the Roosevelt corollary and all that too. But that, I mean, this, this really feels like it's the cold war kind of in a nutshell here. Absolutely. I stumbled across this topic while I was working on my dissertation, actually. I was uh, in the State Department files and kept seeing this reference to the Status of Forces Treaty, and, and the arguments were so interesting. But of course, I was working on my dissertation, and the best dissertation is a done dissertation, so I That's knew I right. had to keep focused. But I also knew that this was a really interesting topic, and it was going to keep bugging me unless I did something. So I started jotting down where I could find those articles again. So I jotted down basically the reference for all of the things that I was finding, uh, especially in the, the decimal file of the, the State Department papers. And that was kind of the rabbit hole. Now, I found it while I was working on my dissertation. I didn't get to play with this topic until years later. It sort of sat there, that paper, or papers, I should say. I had pages of, of notes on status of forces from, from that early visit, but I didn't get to play with it until I got a grant to do some research later. 
and was able to go back to the National Archives and start digging into this fun topic. But it is exactly what you're saying. It wove through everything that was going on at the time. My dissertation topic related to U.S.-European relations, building NATO, integrating West German forces, so a lot of diplomacy between allies. And this issue kept popping up, and it really did hold up a lot of other things and and its tendrils kind of went into all areas because the allies wanted to know or wanted to ensure that at least on paper their sovereign rights were not compromised it was very very important to them to be able to show their populations we are not just a colony or a subsidiary or a dependency of the united states right. yes they're helping us with our defense Yes, they're stationing troops on our soil, and we're giving them land to do it. But no, we are not subject to them. That was such an important point. And frankly, it was important for the United States, too, because if they're saying, you know, this is the defense of the free world, they can't very well go around acting like an imperialist power. Now, there are heavy elements of imperialism in what the United <laughs> States is doing in yes, the Cold War. Yes, there are. But that's just reality but they couldn't appear that way so in this case it's so interesting because the public face and the ideological threads of the cold war actually applied enough pressure to drive this major policy so was the united states powerful enough to force its way absolutely on the one hand but on the other if they had they would have submarined their own interests so they were constrained uh, these officials in their power, in their policy making, uh, significantly constrained by the need, ideologically speaking, to allay these suspicions that no, 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 we're really not imperialists and, and we recognize and, and appreciate your own sovereignty and absolutely will not try to steal that from you. So it's this constant balancing act, and it gets into the ideological elements of the Cold War. It gets into the pragmatic elements of military alliance during the Cold War, gets into economics, and certainly it gets into the tension between the U.S. government and its own people over who are we becoming. And that identity question really, I think, is what grabbed me in the first place that the American people were not ready <laughs> to go where the State Department Legal Advisor's Office was ready to go. Right. It's a, it's a total division between those people who kind of know how international law works and, okay, this is the reality of how we have to engage in the world. And, you know, your average Midwestern housewife who, you know, has a son in the military and is terrified that he's going to end up in Turkey with his arm cut off. Right. And, and, there's so much misinformation out there, but it comes from a very earnest place of Americans wrestling with, why are our troops there in the first place? And then this just makes it even scarier. So this becomes almost a whipping boy for ongoing concerns about American multilateral participation in the world. Yeah, and if you expand the scope a bit, going back, you know, 50 years before the end of World War II, you get back to the Spanish-American War, which was kind of when the United States started to dip its toe into imperialism by taking over, you know, they didn't really take over Cuba, but basically dominated Cuba, but they did take over the places that are still territories today, like Guam, Puerto Rico, but also the Philippines. But then during World War II, the U.S. kind of stepped back and the Philippines you know, fell to the Japanese, and then the Philippines got its independence after the war. And so the, this is happening kind of in an era when the United States is kind of probably, you know, I'm, I'm sure a lot of Americans probably weren't really aware of that context. But, you know, a lot of, you know, it, 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 educated intellectual Americans probably were kind of wrestling with this idea. Well, we were kind of a bit of an imperialist power for a while, but we stopped. <laughs> and for the most part, we still have some <laughs> territories out there, but we, we're trying to stop. And we also need to set ourselves up as different from 
the great powers of Europe, because the great powers of Europe had gotten us into two really nasty worldwide wars. So how do we kind of, you know, distance ourselves from them? We also need to distance ourselves from the Soviet Union, which, as we all know, is out to destroy the entire world or subject it to slavery or whatever, you know, version of anti-communism you want to pursue. But the United States after World War II, you got to imagine, was kind of, again, like you said, trying to kind of figure out how do we fit with the world where we... How do we embrace the ideals of America versus what later generations would call real politic or brinksmanship or whatever? How do we balance the need to project power into the world while also trying to remain true to our values? And that's not a very easy question to answer. And this is kind of one manifestation of this. Like you're saying, you've got you've got the the educated lawyerly type folks who are making a very detailed, very you know logical case for why this should happen but then there's also the uh, uninformed whatever you want to call it people that just are like wait a minute this this whole i like how you phrased it that you know um this whole house of cards why are we even overseas anymore we fixed the world let's come back home and fix the problems at home why are we still stationing hundreds of thousands of troops overseas this is a very weird world that we're in now yeah i guess it does make sense i mean looking at it from when I first looked at your at your project here, I was thinking, well, you know, this is kind of a settled thing. It's kind of amazing that people were opposed to it. But your presentation does bring up a lot of good points about why people actually would kind of oppose it. My thought when you were talking about uh, Senator Brinker, Bricker from Ohio, my thought was that didn't at some point someone just sit him down and say, look, if we're going to be there, we have to obey this. <laughs> we can't just stomp on those other countries. But I do kind of see Bricker's side of it, too. That's a very complicated issue, and so it's not surprising that it created a lot of controversy. Sure, and I, I think people forget, you know, we think of the 50s, Eisenhower, Cold War, like there's some kind of clean break with the past. And the reality is we can't discount the level of history involved. I mean, obviously, the, the isolationist period, so-called, uh, before World War II kind of stands out, but it goes all the way back, as you said, that there is this tension or this sense that Americans don't play the dirty geopolitical game, that we don't engage in that. I think especially of when John Quincy Adams was Secretary of State way back when, he uh, has this famous quote where he talks about the United States does not go abroad in search of monsters to destroy, that somehow we have this sort of moral virtue that we're not seeking out problems. Right. We're, we're staying at home and, and doing our thing. And, of course, he's very expansionist. He's not opposed to expansionism. He's not opposed to engagement in the world. What he is opposed to and what most Americans are opposed to is some kind of permanent tie to anything out there in the world. And that had been a part of the American psyche and the American identity for Century, a <laughs> century. You know, we're, we're talking about a very long period of time, right up until going into World War II. So, you know, let's say that isolationist sentiment goes away to fight the war. That doesn't mean that people had completely abandoned that ideology or that worldview. It just means that they saw this was a war that we need to fight. Right. It doesn't mean they changed their mind about right. the role the U.S. should play in the world. And so, you know, we see quite a few uh, major figures in the Senate and elsewhere, uh, a significant minority, let's call them, that are calling for a, a different kind of defense, that rather than have something like NATO, what we should do is build up our Navy and use our oceans as this buffer and focus on protecting our borders, albeit expanded borders. You know, that, no, we America. really don't need to, yes, we should not have troops stationed abroad at all, that that's not something we should do. We should use naval and air power and uh, keep everything at an arm's length. Now, of course, that is kind of naive because of the way in which technology <laughs> had changed the world, but they didn't realize it yet. They're still talking about that kind of thing in 48 and 49, and so negotiating these kinds of treaties we hadn't been abroad for very long. I think, you know, I'm, I'm still, I still think that nineties was a decade ago, I, you know, <laughs> and, and the, it feels that way anyway, but you know, we're talking about NATO within five years of the end of world war two, less than five years. Germans had guns in their hands 
in 10 years after the end of World War II. What? That's so fast. Everything is changing at a breakneck speed, and people are adjusting as fast as they can, but the less education you have or the less exposure you have to the outside world, you know, I'm not saying they're stupid, they're just not connected in that way, and so they can't keep up. Even very, very smart people who do have that education and those connections can't keep up because a paradigm shift is hard. It's hard on everyone. Honestly, I think that's what draws me to certain periods is because things are changing faster than people can keep up, and so they let a lot more slip in terms of their identity, their understanding of their own nation, their understanding of others, their place in the world. They're, they're letting it all out because they're frantically trying to either hold on to the past or figure out the future, and so they're, they're a lot more open about culturally where they are and where they're going. And so those kinds of transitional periods always have captivated me as a historian. That is interesting to think of it as a transitional period because we tend to think of, you know, this is the period of American greatness. This is when, you know, the American century is in full bloom at this point and we're at the, you know, the top of the food chain and all of that. But that is that is different <laughs> from what, from the way it was. But I mean, sure, we we bailed out Europe at the end of World War One, but that was after both sides had pretty much beaten each other to a pulp. We just walked in and you know knocked them over. Uh, <laughs> beyond that, our previous adventures around the world had been, you know, th various interventions in Latin America and then that Spanish American War. And so yeah, we this was a new new I mean it was a new world for everybody it was a new world for the US too because I mean there had never been a United Nations before you know the League of Nations the US had rejected that after World War 1 and so we've got this new super organization and so yeah I, I guess I can see that you know there's going to be a lot of fear what is that new organization what going to do we don't get to vote for anybody in that organization so there goes democracy if that organization starts to stomp all over us and so yeah that's that's I, I, you know, I can see why that's terrifying to people. And it gets even scarier for a lot of folks as you move further into the 50s. You know, today I just focused on NATO. So you're talking about European nations. Uh, let's just talk about the elephant in the room. U.S. troops were going to be stationed in non-white nations. Yeah. With not European cultures. And this was profoundly terrifying to people. And the idea that an arrangement similar to SOFA, the, the NATO SOFA, would be applied in, say, Korea. Just, no, absolutely not. Or, heaven forbid, Japan. What? No, this is foolishness. How could we possibly trust their courts to be fair in any way, shape, or form? Because, of course, we all know what they're like. Right. There is this profound layer of, of racism and cultural fear and tension when we start expanding beyond Europe. It's bad enough arguing over Europe, but then when we have to expand outward. And then here, here's, here's a ticklish position. The Japanese were very, very ardent that we get the same deal that NATO got. But Korea actually didn't get the same deal that NATO got. Hmm. So... The aggressor in World War II gets a good deal, and our ally or ally. someone we bailed out doesn't. The Philippines didn't get the same deal oh, that Japan didn't. That Japan did. So I mean, there's a there's a lot as as again we're we're expanding outward, and but they're at the same time that ideology, right? We can't appear to be racist and imperialist towards these nations because the non-aligned world will look at that and say, "Ha ha, we knew it." You're aligned with right. the Europeans and you're imperialists just like them and so on and so forth. So they have to at least appear on the outside to be even handed, but it's hard and it's a constant process of negotiation, not only with their allied nations, but also within the U.S. government and then in public relations with the, the population as a whole. So it's a multi-way diplomacy Mm -hmm. Not only with foreign nations, but also with domestic constituencies. Well, yeah, and and if the U.S. can't be shown or doesn't want to be seen granting favors to some people over another, but at the same time, the U.S. still has Jim Crow at home, and so yeah. the the image is there that the U.S. can't possibly treat, you know, the global South or the Third World or whatever term you wanted to use, isn't going to treat any of them fairly 
they don't even treat their own citizens fairly. And so that's there's just public relations problems all over the place there. Yes, absolutely. And certainly policymakers are are not angels. You know, I, I sort of generalize about the, the State Department versus the Defense Department, and those are the, the general positions that they took. But that doesn't mean everyone in the State Department is entirely on board with this or that, you know, there isn't a pretty extensive um, – almost jingoistic attitude in so many corners of the U.S. government. But those voices kind of get weeded out over time as as that more pragmatic realpolitik, we got to live in the world we live in kind of attitude took over. You see fewer and fewer people, at least in higher positions, um, who express those kinds of attitudes. So it, it's a, in some ways an adolescence shall we say, for U.S. diplomacy as they figure out both internally and externally how they need to be in order to meet the needs of the, the current world environment because it's different from anything else they've ever had. Right. This is the toddler years of NATO and the U.N. It's uh, is this thing going to work? Is this because I mean, those were largely experimental organizations at that point. They were new. No one, like I said, no one had ever done them before. The League of Nations didn't work out so well. Um, so maybe, <laughs> you know, let's try it again with the U.N. Hopefully the U.N. can hold it all together and NATO can hold it together. But it's it's an experiment. Uh, it's and so who knows if this is going to if this is going to succeed or if it's going to fail. And a lot of people, I'm sure, are very terrified that if those fail, Oh, my God, are we getting back into World War Two, which, you know, as we all know, I mean, death on an unprecedented scale uh, with millions of people dislocated, millions of people dead. Are we going to go fall back into that type of chaos or are we going to put aside some sovereignty and some of our differences in order to try to make sure that this experiment works? And so. That different people are going to have a very different perspective on that. There's going to be some people who are going to be terrified at the possibility that the experiment fails. And then there's going to be others that say, well, you know, <laughs> it's not that big a deal. We survived without it before. We will survive it after, with it afterwards. So it, it creates kind of a, possibly among some people, kind of an, even an existential fear about what is the future of the world going to look like? Are we going to continue on in this bloody warfare with massive new technologies like nuclear weapons? Or... Do we find some way to stop that, even if it requires giving up some of our own protections and all of that? And that's a difficult decision to make for a lot of people. Absolutely. And I think that's why, uh, again, our boys become such a powerful symbol. Yes. It's, well, well, what are we doing? Are we exposing ourselves at the end of a at the end of a long line here? Are we are we setting ourselves up to get hurt? by putting ourselves out as a nation. And, and these service members acted as kind of like a lightning rod for public opinion and public fears of, you know, are we going to get drawn into a bloody global conflict for people who don't even have the level of gratitude that it would take to turn our service members over to the UCMJ? You know, do, do we really want to, to put ourselves out for, for people who won't respect that kind of sacrifice? You know, and, and of course, not not looking at it from the perspective of the allies who are also going through their own existential crisis of, you know, I used to be <laughs> a fairly independent world power, and now I have absolutely no ability to defend myself. Right. Because in, in the changing world conditions, with the power of the Soviet Union, especially after they acquire uh, atomic weaponry, there is no way any European nation could stand on its own. Right. There's no way that any European nation, or even all of them combined, could offer a serious deterrent for a determined Soviet Union. So, on the one hand, they're used to being great powers, and on the other there's this sense that without the U.S., they're sunk, and they yeah. hate that feeling. They hate it, and they <laughs> take it out on on uh, little signs that the United States might be acting in an imperialistic manner. Anytime that sort of implication crops up, they're very sensitive to it. And so, again, while the governments of these nations might be more pragmatic and realize, yeah, we kind of need the United States – we need them badly. We want to accommodate them 
their populations are a little slower to catch up and frankly less willing to catch up and and want to cling to their old independence in some sense um, or at least the idea uh, if we're going to do European unity that well we're going to be strong enough so that we're as strong as our American partner they're not catching up they're not seeing that uh, or not willing to acknowledge that the the U.S. is the stronger partner. And so any implication, they're going to resent it and make life very difficult for their own government. So the U.S. is not the only nation having this major internal strife over the status of forces. Right. Uh, All of these other nations are as well. And so they're all, at the governmental level, they're all trying to accommodate each other's needs as best as they can, but they can't ignore the fact that their population's at home also have some fairly strong and contending opinions on this whole situation. So that's that, that made for some interesting um, <laughs> summary notes on the negotiations. Yeah. Because they're all trying to help each other, but they can't overtly say, look, let, let's just do this in, in a way that will help your population and my population. And, you know, it's all, it's all compromise. You know, I suppose most diplomacy is, but... Um, the reality is, at the end of the day, the European governments of NATO basically made secret agreements that said, you can try your own troops. We, we're not even really going to try, except in, you know, really important symbolic cases where it's just a particularly egregious crime. To, if it's important to us politically, then we might retain jurisdiction. But mm-hmm. in 90% of court cases, we'll just give them back to you, and you can try them by the UCMG. They, but the, those had to be classified because their populations would go up in flames. Right. Well, that's great. The U.S. is getting what it's, it wants, tons of protections for our boys. But while the Defense Department might know about it, it's classified. So they can't very well go to... Uh, the senators, for the most part, or the public, you know, publish an article saying, look, they've ceded, you know, giving us basically, you know, our own jurisdiction all the time. Right. Except if you get, you know, they can't say that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They can't reveal it. So some of these people who are attacking the status of forces agreement don't realize that they are actually peeling protections away from the troops uh, by doing so. (laughs) Oh, man, that must have been so frustrating <laughs> for the state and the defense departments. Yes, we you're arguing for something that already exists, people. Come on. Right. Exactly. <laughs> oh, wow. That, well, this is a this is a really interesting presentation and um, this is a great topic. And what do you have any plans for this? Uh, is this going to you trying to try publish this somewhere or what's up? What's next for you? Um, well, this piece I am I am working on publishing. I um, hope to start with a an article focusing on the the NATO elements. This is kind of it ended up getting put on the back burner because of life and various things. But I'm pulling it out and dusting it off <laughs> and and starting again. But ideally, what I would love to do is a, a book length monograph that deals not only with NATO, but with a lot of these other nations as well. I think it's a very important project, not just uh, historically speaking, but um, just honestly, let me be blunt. In the last 10 years, I have noticed a profound ignorance of what a status of forces agreement is. We still have them, Mm -hmm. but nobody knows what they are. Mm. You look on the news and They are reporting, and I I won't be specific because I don't want to get political, but they'll report on our presence in a certain nation or withdrawing from a certain nation or, you know, this president did X, Y, and Z. Like, no, actually, that was part of the status of forces agreement. Or, you know, we're we're pulling out because this host country did A, B, and C. Like, yeah, you know, if you'd actually – signed the status of forces agreement that they were begging for and which they put in everything that we wanted, then we could have, you know, continued a presence and maybe not had such a bad backlash as we ended up having. So there's, there's so much in the world today Mm -hmm. that a better understanding of what is a status of forces agreement, what's going on behind the scenes, as well as uh, what are its implications for foreign policy, for stability in the world, 
for the nature of sovereignty and the relationships between sovereign nations. You know, such important questions for contemporary global society. And uh, no one seems to know about it at all. Yeah. yeah. Well, as you've demonstrated in this project here, there's a lot of nuance. There's a lot of subtlety and details and, you know, history that goes into all of these decisions that are not apparent to people that are not trained in those fields. And so people jump to the conclusions that my common sense tells me that this is stupid. Well, <laughs> OK, but there it exists for a reason. And right. there's a lot of thinking. And as you've demonstrated here, there's a lot of back and forth. There's a lot of compromise. People thought a lot about this stuff. All of these treaties that come before us, whether we sign on to them or not, whether we withdraw from them or not, these are the products of umpteen thousand hours of work from some very smart people who have hopefully thought through all of the various permutations and possibilities and consequences didn't, it may not always work out, but these things are there for a reason. And until we know what the reason is, it's difficult to really pass judgment on it effectively because you just have you, you just don't know exactly what's going on here because there's getting rid of one thing could lead to some other consequences that no one ever, ever even thought of before. And so it's it's a good idea to take time before condemning and ripping up agreements. It takes it's a good idea to kind of think about what was the the background of those of that agreement what was the give and take what what were the other options what could have been what didn't be you know how did we benefit how did someone else benefit how did we not benefit there's a lot of thought that goes into it and so i i yeah i wish people would pay more attention to that stuff it's, <laughs> but unfortunately it also is very it's hard <laughs> it takes a lot of time and a lot of people don't have time in their lives to do that kind of thing so Unfortunately, a lot of people kind of fall back on the knee-jerk reactions that uh, is a big part of our politics these days. But again, we don't want to go too much into right. <laughs> modern politics. <laughs> and, and the reality is sometimes they get it wrong, and they get it wrong often enough that the American public uh, and publics around the world feel justified in mm. trusting their good old common sense. True. Because yeah. my good old common sense says that was a bad idea, and look, it blew up in our faces. So, you know... People, I mean, people aren't stupid. This isn't about being stupid. This is right. about um, being informed because it doesn't mean we necessarily need to make a status of forces agreement with any given power or it doesn't mean we necessarily need to keep troops everywhere where we think we need to keep troops. But it does mean that we need to think about it and think about, as you say, those, those second and third order effects that uh, the ripple out from, from our choices. And if a treaty took years to put together, maybe we should give a little bit of time to considering what's going to happen if we dismantle it or you know, what happens if we create a new treaty here, there, and everywhere. You know, diplomacy is often dismissed as, you know, the smoky back rooms and dead white guys kind of history. But um, there is a lot of layer and nuance and cultural importance in the field of foreign relations. And I think if maybe people had a better grasp of the history of U.S. foreign policy and international relations, they would have a more informed frame of reference and context for contemporary issues as well. Definitely, and I think that's a good place to uh, wrap this up. So thank you for joining us today. This was a really informative topic and a really interesting conversation afterwards, so thank you for coming. Oh, my pleasure, Rob. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us today. If you have any questions or comments on this podcast, please send me an email at workinghistorians at gmail.com. For Stephanie Averill, I am Rob Denning, and have a good day. Hello, and welcome to History Soundbites. I am Rob Denning, the faculty lead for history at Southern New Hampshire University's Global Campus, and joining me today is Dr. Stephanie Averill, who is going to be presenting a presentation. Presenting a presentation? Oh, good Lord. Anyway.